what happened here? Something, I lost my, whoo, okay, there we go. Well, hello everyone. I am so excited to be here. You guys, I've been so excited about this class. I hope that you liked the story. And now it's saying I'm really quiet. Well, just, just let me listen to it. Okay. Um, we worked last night. Mr. Vanstar and I played with the microphone over and over and over again. So hopefully I'm not quiet. Um, no, I hope. I hope that that is not a problem. Um, so let me jump in to the story. So we, well, not the story. You know how we have coolness that we have to do first. So, um, okay, we're Friday night now. And now on Friday nights, what we do to have a good time is that we come to English class. But, um, oh yeah, oh yeah, you guys are noticing I came on and went off. And it's because I lost the PowerPoint. I had to go fix it. Um, it just wouldn't be class. <laughs> it have some tech difficulty. Anyway, when I was your age, on Friday nights, the thing that we did was watch two shows, The Love Boat and Fantasy Island. And these were the shows. And Fantasy Island did not come on until 10 o'clock. And so it was like super, super, super late. So I feel like this story reminded me so much of Fantasy Island. In the show Fantasy Island, there was this guy named Mr. Rourke and then his trusty sidekick Tattoo, the shorter guy, and he operated this very exclusive, very private island where people would come and pay to have their like fantasy lived out, like to see their long lost daughter again or go do something really crazy and... um so I feel like ever, whenever I read the story, I just think about Fantasy Island. And this is, um, this is what it looked like as Mr. Rourke. My dear guests, I am Mr. Rourke, your host. And that's how he would greet everybody. It was so fun. There he is. Um, and it, it, was just, it was just awesome. And there, that's how it looked all the time. So it showed up, Fantasy Island also showed up in The Simpsons. Of course, like everything does. But I thought it was funny because do you remember when we read um, A Sound of Thunder that that had shown up in this same Simpsons thing of Treehouse of Horror, same one showed up. It was so crazy. Um, so I was wondering, did this story remind you at all of A Sound of Thunder? Did any of you pick up on that? So um, Mark C. and Jay Sand, I just love that. I like my total dream would be if we all lived in the same place and we actually had class together every day where we were just hanging out and talking about. Um, so did anybody, oh, and there's Dracon Warrior with his Intero bang. Oh, I love it. That is awesome. So did any of you remind you of uh, Sound of Thunder? Curious about that. I, I thought there was some similarities. The big hunting, stuff like that, just curious. All right, so thank you, stars. Let's highlight some of the stuff that um, came up out of last week's class. Looks like maybe I've made myself a little too too big here because feels like I uh, am in it. Let me see. Let me make myself a little bit smaller. I don't know. I didn't do a good job, I guess. I don't want to make myself too small. Then I can't see. Um, so this was um, how you guys felt about Flowers for Algernon was... Um, Strudel Kitty, and I'm doing fine, but it's like Flowers for Algernon, it hit me hard. Anna Snell said it was very interesting, so Anna gets the prize this week for most diplomatic student. 
Um, Deb Coatney, yeah, it's a bit of a shock. <laughs> so that was so funny. Um, Mark thought it was weird. Strudel Kitty thought it was painful. Simon agreed with her, especially the end. Um, Strudel Kitty had to spell painful out in an interesting way that I think I'm just too old to understand what that means. And then Natasha was willing to risk everyone and say she actually kind of enjoyed it, which was pretty amazing for her to say. And then um, Christine's rating cracked me up. What just happened, right? And then Deb Coatney, uh, I was going to read, this, this made me laugh out loud. I was going to read the short story, but I didn't have time. I've read the novel twice now. I just love that. That was, that was beautiful. That was like a beautiful paradoxical statement. So Michael, good job. Okay, so then we had some more cool comments. Um, Mark C said, when, when I asked about, do you like stories that are like just the happy stories or do you like stories with all the feels, like the ones that make you feel everything? And he said he likes all the feels because otherwise it feels unnatural. 50 pages ago is all gloom and despair and then it turns to happy unicorns, right? Like it's like there's those endings, like are endings okay that give you all the feels? And I liked that description because sometimes it does feel what, what are called HEAs, happily ever after, sometimes feel a little bit forced. Um, and... Michael said that uh, he was talking about it with his mom and they came up with the hypothesis that stories with a greater emotional feel are more satisfying and fulfilling. And I thought that was good too, right? Like, oh, thank you, Strudel Kitty, for giving me some pop culture. Um, you're really stressing the word in a quiet, upsetish way. That is lovely. Thank you. So I thought, I agree with you guys. Um, Michael, I agree with you and your mom that the stories that have an emotional feel are the ones that stick with you, you know, like they're the ones. And so if you read a story that doesn't really give you that, sometimes you need the teacher to help you with that. Cause I would say that muffin was like that, that when you read muffin, if you read it without a teacher, it just seems like kind of a, eh, you know, okay, it's a story. But if you get to know the feels, then it's more satisfying and fulfilling. So I agree with that. All right. I loved the comments that you guys had about the bookmarks and I have something to share with you about them, but um, I just thought that was so cool. So this is the link to where you can download your own. So if you have them, if you got yours in the mail, but you want more, you could just go here and print them and they will print four to a page. So you could just print as many as you want. And um, so that is there. If you are on the email list, you would have got an email with that link already, but um, that is where the bookmarks are. So that was so fun. So if you missed that class, you can go back and watch it. They're all on the YouTube channel. And then I thought this was a really interesting comment that Michael made to Simon about that the death of Algernon symbolized the death of Charlie's newfound intelligence. And it, in some ways, when I read that comment from him, it made me think about the fact that it was almost foreshadowing, right? It was like foreshadowing what was going to happen to him. And his sense of loss over both of those things mirrored each other. I thought that was kind of interesting. And it made me think about what that made me think about, Michael. Okay, that's funny, Strudel Kitty. Um, what that made me think about, Michael, was the idea that when, um, when Charlie was saying at the end, like, please leave flowers on Algernon's grave sometimes, that really the parallel of that was that he was hoping that people would remember him. Like it wasn't really just the mouse. And I had never thought of that until I read this comment from you. So I appreciated that. Um, Natasha, but did it destroy his life? We were talking about like that he got high IQ and then low IQ again and being in that experiment. Did it destroy his life? And she said, um, would it be better to at least experience it once? And I think that is really the core question of that story, right? That's, that's the thing because we all have that. We all have something that we're going to get and then we lose it. And is it better to have it and lose it or better to never have had it at all and not know what you were missing? I think that is like such a strong question, right? I loved this, that uh, when we were looking at the idea of is Charlie truly a dynamic character because he changes, but then he goes back. And so is that true dynamism? Like, did he really change or is it more circular? And so then it makes him static. So that was kind of interesting. Um, Mark C said, it's, it's more about the change that occurs than the difference from beginning to end. And I think, um, um, Mark, that is so insightful of a comment that a, a dynamic character can be one who changes through the course of the story, but then ends up almost back where they began. And you will see that more. And you can see you guys, I didn't do a very good job of estimating where my picture would be. 
Um, so Cookie Cookie said, I'll read the part that's cut off. I apologize for that. Um, Cookie Cookie said, from what I know, he himself would be changed in the fact that he can see how normal people see the world. He can't go back be since he knows how everyone gets treated based on the way they act. And so I think Cookie Cookie brings up an important point that even though his intelligence returned to what it was, his understanding did not. That he had comprehension that he didn't have before. And I, I thought that was an important insight. Um, you guys liked my glasses. I didn't bring them tonight. I'll have to bring them again sometime, but y'all like, liked the glasses and I got a big, uh, kick out of that. Um, and then, <laughs> and then Jay said, you guys talking about the friends that he had, we all decided like with friends like those who needs enemies, those guys who were so mean to him. And the, it, it is ironic. Like he thinks they're his friends, but they're really not his friends. It was, it was very distressing to, to think about that. And Natasha had this insight. It's like the book, The Uglies. And I don't know if any of you have read it, but it's about how everyone is turned pretty. So then there's no more or less, but it doesn't work out. And those kinds of dystopias that exp it kind of explore, can we really make everyone the same? And is that a desirable goal? Um, are always so interesting, always so interesting. Okay, Strudel Kitty, I'm calling it now. Strudel Kitty is going to become an academician who can who conducts quality research because Strudel Kitty understands that they didn't wait for their test to finish. So they were not very good scientists because they would have had to wait for Algernon to die and then test it before they started in on human testing. And so I agree with you. Good call. All right, you guys. You were fans of the Interrobang. So, um, the, and Will really did it. And then of course, Dracon already got it going on today. And then um, Jay Sand said, hang on, did you actually just tell me that you saw Unicorn in London and the Interrobang? So here's some others of the sentences. How did I not know about this awesome punctuation? Or wait, where did my pencils go? And what? Peeps are awesome. Sorry, I blocked that part. And then, Oh, Mrs. Van, this is totally a story to like, but even more a story to change you. And Clafon, I totally want that printed on my headstone. So Mr. Van Star, when I die, you need to print that on my headstone. Uh, and then I loved this that Simon pulls out. Like it, I've learned a lot from it and show me some important lessons. And I think that sometimes even though the even though the stories that we like the most and enjoy the most aren't always the ones that stick with us. So Thank you for, for pointing that out and recognizing that this was one, perhaps, of those stories. Um, and then <laughs> when I announced what this week's story would be, or tonight's story, was pff, how dangerous could a game even be? So that was awesome. Um, I thought that was funny. So Srignus wants to know, inquiring dragons want to know, what do you think? What do you think? One to five. Okay, Serignus, they're going to tell us. Did you like it? Let's see. We'll go with, um, like, tongue stickouts. Let's see if that works. Okay, scale of one to five, Serignus. How did you like Most Dangerous Game? I liked it. One, two, three, four. Only four? I was a little distressed by the hunting. I don't think I have the right voice for Shrignus. I need a different voice. It, should he have a deeper voice? I want to, should Shrignus be a male dragon or a female dragon? I need a voice. I should ask Shrignus. All right. Um, oh, look at this. 8.3. Okay, this is very nice. Um, looking lots of high scores for this. Lots of high scores. Will? What? A two. Whoa. Okay. What's up with that? Um, let's see. Well, let's ask the magic eight ball. Will Mrs. Van be able to persuade Will that he likes this story more than a two? My sources say, never mind. Let's try again. Very duck. One more time. My reply. Most likely. And there you have it from the Magic 8 Ball. I'm going to change. Okay, there we go. Squeaky voice female. Nice. Okay. 
All right, are you guys ready to dive in? Super fun story, super fun. Okay, so let's visit the plot. You know how it goes. Backstory, big game hunter Rainsford is on a ship in the Caribbean passing, okay, Caribbean or Caribbean? You guys can vote. Um, passing Ship Trap Island. Okay, then Rainsford, oh, Jay Sand has the same magnifying glass. Um, and then Rainsford falls over. I'm calling it that that is the um, inciting incident because if he hadn't fallen over, like if he hadn't got his pipe caught in the rope and then went after it, fallen over, he wouldn't have been there. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so rising action, swims to the island, hunted by Zeroff. And then I put in parentheses, jumps off cliff because... I think you can argue that his jumping off the cliff and then hiding in Zero's room together are the climax. So you got, <gasps> I do not think I'm cheating simply to request a second opinion. I cannot believe you guys, <laughs> you guys would say I was cheating. I mean, you, that's how the magic eight ball works. Um, so you guys can tell me what you think, right? Um, do you think that his jumping off the cliff is part of the climax or part of the rising action? It, it's a, you know, there's no right or wrong. It's just what you think. And then I put, they fight in parentheses because it's the falling action, but it doesn't actually happen in script, right? Like we don't read it. We just know it happens implied. Um, let's see. Did the general intend to hunt Rainsford or genuinely intend to hunt with him? Oh, no. Yeah, no. I don't think he ever, like, I don't think he ever intended to go with him. Okay. And then the, um, look at how bad of a job I did. I don't know. I think I must have not quite set this up right because I did it the way I always do it. All right. So Rainsford sleeps in Zeref's bed after killing him. And I had to ask Mr. Van Star, how do you spell dun 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 dun? Right. I didn't know how to spell it. Um, so anyway, that's it. That's it. All right. So thoughts? Anybody? Let, let's hear any pushback. What do you think? I'm really curious about your opinion. What do you think about does jumping off the cliff belong in the rising action or does it belong in the climax? So interesting. Okay. I'm looking at what Simon says about the inciting incident. You could argue his not being able to sleep. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Stuart, could he, okay. Curious about that. No, he wanted to kill him. Okay. All right. So at the very beginning, I mean, the very first line of the story we get, it's rather a mystery. And then we have the insta suspense, right? Oh, okay, Strudel Kitty, thank you for the, oh, oh look, and Jay San has one too. Dun, 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 da. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. All right, so I think when we get this insta suspense, as soon as we hear the word mystery or unusual or rumor or something like that, I know that final line though. All right, so let oh man this is so fun so let's look at suspense for a second what do we mean when we talk about suspense suspense is one of the core literary terms that you need to know you have to be able to know what we mean when we say suspense when we're talking about literature so what do we mean this is what we mean by suspense in literature it is a quality of literature that makes the reader uncertain or tense or anxious about the outcome so that's what suspense is. Suspense doesn't have to be scary. It just has to create an uncertainty. Um, something like, I'm just not sure what's going to happen here, right? So I think a lot of times we think that a story isn't suspenseful simply because it doesn't have this super strong plot that is just going from one car chase to another or one ghost or one gunshot. It is suspense is the quality of creating uncertainty in the reader and it's often connected to foreshadowing often we'll have foreshadowing where it's like ooh, something bad is going to happen right so here's there's so there is so much figurative language in this story i pulled out some the dank tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick warm blackness in upon the yacht that is personification personification is when we give human characteristics to things that are not human and so here the knight is being given the this human characteristic that it's got this thick warm blanket you know now that i'm looking at it i'm thinking maybe i shouldn't have called it personification maybe i should have called it, it was palpable as pregnant maybe that's just imagery hmm uh, mrs van's gonna think about this all right um it was like moist black velvet which is a simile because we've got a comparing 
two things using like as than or a verb like resembles. I know that a lot of people don't like the word moist. They feel like it sounds weird. So here's what I think is weird about that. When people say they don't like a word like moist, but I think, well, you say joist like in a ceiling, like a joist that holds stuff up and nobody thinks anything of it. So I don't know. Any moist haters will just move right along. Okay. Oh my word. Look what I did here, but it's all, all you know what? Let me, nope, can't do it. All right. Um, don't talk rot, Whitney, said Rainsford. This is, Whitney is the guy on the boat still, right? So Rainsford's still on the boat. You're a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how a jaguar feels? Now, you know what, friends? As soon as a character says, who cares about what those people think? Or who cares what a jaguar feels? Instantly, you know, this guy is going to be made to care what a jaguar feels. And then what you can't see, um, oh no, I don't have anything behind that. That's good. Okay. And then this is what happens, you know, roll karma charm activated. You will see, you will see this very night, right? Dark and stormy night. Oh yeah, Mark, see, can he use a thunder stick? That would have been awesome. Okay. So <laughs> rain starts. the world is made up of two classes, the hunters and the hunties. Luckily, you and I are hunters. Yes. Right? Ooh, it's so suspenseful, it's so suspenseful. The suspense just builds because they go to this, they go by this island and what's the deal with this island? So did you notice how Connell built this suspense? Did you notice it when you were reading? What details did he add to make it creepy? Did you feel that way? Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'm too old to notice that too. I'm looking at Deb Coatney's comment. Um, okay, so what did you notice about how you built suspense? Did you notice it? Or did you read it and think, yep, no suspense here, folks. Kind of curious. Let me know what you think about the suspense. Can't wait to see it in the comments. More similes because, as I mentioned, figurative language for days. So the sea was as flat as a plate glass window. What's interesting, though, is that plate glass windows are vertical and the sea is horizontal. So I'm not 100% sure that I feel like that's the strongest metaphor I was, or simile. I was trying to think of something that you can compare it to that would be flat and smooth. Um, so I don't know, but I, I thought about like flat as a pancake, but pancakes aren't shiny. And I think it was trying to give the feel that the sea was somewhat reflective. So I don't really know. Um, yeah, that boat scene, you can really, yeah, the night, having it be night. Yeah, Strudel Kitty, that's an important point, right? It happens at night. If it had happened in the daytime, it would have felt so much different, right? Um, yeah, so glad nobody hunts me. Yeah, <laughs> Jay San weighs away the suspense. That is funny, Jay San, you just made me laugh. All right. Um, suspense was there, but not totally overwhelming. Okay, yeah, and that's an important point, too, because you don't want the suspense to be overwhelming, because otherwise not believable. And then, did any of you notice this when Rainsford says pure imagination, when Whitney is telling him that there's all this, um, he, uh, when, so it was Whitney describing the island and Whitney says about a night that they went by, right? There was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate glass window. We were drawing near the island then. What I felt was a, a mental chill, a sort of sudden dread. Pure imagination, said Rainsford. And I instantly thought of the scene in Willy Wonka. And they have the song, pure imagination, right? Come with me. And the thing I thought was interesting about that is that Willy Wonka is dark. I mean, all of Raoul Dahl's novels are dark. We should read a Raoul Dahl novel. But um, Raoul Dahl's novels are so dark. And Willy Wonka is dark. I mean, think about the grape girl and every, like all the bad stuff that happens to these kids. And so as soon as he said, says pure imagination, I'm like, oh, it's like Willy Wonka, right? Like Willy Wonka. Um, okay. I don't know if anybody else noticed that. I thought this was such an interesting idea when he says, sometimes I think evil is a tangible thing with wavelengths, just as sound and light have. And the reason I put a picture here of the, um, of the black hole is because they used to think that black holes just sucked energy. And so they were like negative energy, but then they found out, um, <laughs> Strudel Kitty, Mrs. Van, man, these books are so dark. Let's read them. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> that's funny. That should be a meme. <laughs> um, so 
so they found out though a few years ago that black holes actually emit negative energy like they don't just suck in energy they're spewing negative energy and i think that's kind of interesting too yeah the gunshots that was another thing that was um building suspense okay then we have onomatopoeia because just can't get enough figurative language um the swish and the ripple of the wash of the propeller and so there's a couple things going on here you've got swish and ripple which are both like kind of onomatopoeic especially swish but then swish and then wash that end rhyme match is kind of note um and i just want it noted that i can spell onomatopoeia without even looking it up and that's what happens my friends if you have a master's degree in english all right, um, and that's about what it's good for. So, the night would be my eyelids. Ooh, I just thought that was so cool. Like, it was so dark, you didn't even have to close your eyes to sleep. The night would be my eyelids. I thought that was so, so cool. Okay, an abrupt sound startled him. The cry was pinched off short as the blood-warm waters of the Caribbean Sea doused over his head. You know what? In my copy I had, there were a couple typos, and one of the typos was this. It said... Um, the blood warm waters of the Caribbean Sea dosed over his head. And I don't know how many of you notice that. I always notice those typos though. But, um, and then onomatopoeia is where the um, sound, I see a comment. Onomatopoeia is where um, it's a figurative language device where the word is, the word is making the sound it's describing. So bam, pow, crash. These are words that sound exactly like they're spelled they represent that actual word um yeah yeah eliza saying that you read charlie willy wonka and you're like whoa yeah charlie and chocolate factory and you're like whoa what happened yeah mine had typos too yes yeah. so um when you hear this like run for your life right like he hears he hears this sound and uh yeah i would run so he says what perils that tangle of trees and underbrush might hold for him underbrush might hold for him did not concern Rainford just now. All he knew was that he was safe from his enemy, the sea. And this is foreshadowing because as soon as someone says, oh, he's not worried about this thing that everybody would be worried about, he's escaped from his enemy, you pretty much want to send him a, send him a, a telegram saying, you have not escaped from the enemy, right? The enemy is going to find you. Um, oh, Strudel Kitty knew what, she, knew what it meant, just want to know if you're spelling it right. Yes, you get an honorary master's degree. All right. Um, mine didn't have any typos. It was the full version. Y'all are never going to let me forget that. Okay, so I love these gifts, right? Out of the frying pan and into the fire. I think that's exactly what I mean. Did any of you think that? Well, out of the frying pan, into the fire, right? All right, so Mrs. Van says, his knowledge is giving him a false sense of security. And I think that this is an important thing to consider is sometimes do we know too much? So he reckon, and the way that we know that he knows stuff is that he recognizes the shell casing right away, knows, oh, it's a 22. Um, he understands the tracks, like he can interpret them and what has happened. He can tell the story of it and he can follow the tracks. And so we understand, oh, this guy knows his stuff. He, it, he knows what it's doing, yes. Wu is also on a monopoeia and of course must have at least one Lord of the Rings reference per class. Eagerly, he hurried along and it's because he thinks that man equals safe, but he's wrong. And I think the, one of the things that this story does as a subtext is confront that idea that when you're learned, you think you are wise. And I think that is interesting. Okay, here's the description of this house. All the lights were in one enormous building. So he'd seen all these lights and thought it was like a town, but it turned out to all be coming from one building, right? All the lights were in one enormous building, a lofty structure with pointed towers plunging upward into the gloom. And that's kind of interesting because plunging is usually a word that we use to describe something going down. And here it's plunging upward. The shadowy outlines of a palatial chateau, it was set on a high bluff and on three sides of it, cliffs dived down to where the sea licked greedy lips in the shadows. So now we have more personification that the sea has lips. Yes. And Eliza says he misunderstood the actual morality of the situation. Yeah, he had the book learning, but he did not understand the social and emotional implication yet, right? He did not understand the morality. Now, I think that this story is remarkable for many reasons, but one of them is it's Academy Award level indirect characterization. So amazing. Let's look at this. So we have this character, 
of um, Zeroff as seen by Rainford. This is how he's described. And so indirect characterization is when the narrator doesn't tell us. We learn from things that other characters say, other characters observe, things that the character himself says or does. That's how we learn about them. And so there's so much good indirect characterization in this story. So you see that Rainsford describes him as singularly handsome, almost bizarre quality about his face, um, tall, past middle age, hair of vivid white. So in the movie, they didn't make his hair white. So often the movie doesn't match the book. Um, but his eyebrows and pointed military mustache were as black as the night. Again, a simile. His eyes, too, were black and very bright. He had high cheekbones, a sharp-cut nose, a square, a spare, meaning thin, dark face, the face of a man used to giving orders, the face of an aristocrat. And so much is made of the money, but it never says where he made the money. So I wondered if any of you had guesses, like, where do you think he made his money? Yeah, nice. Oh, I'm loving some of your comments over here. This is so cool. Um, okay, clothes made by an exclusive tailor. Um, it even says in the story that the tailor only made clothes for nobody below the rank of Duke. Well, the only person above the rank of Duke is King. So uh, pretty high. Um, he, the, you know, the room is paneled in oak, finest of everything, linen, crystal, silver, china, food and drink. He is thoughtful. He is affable, meaning like easy to get along with, charismatic, charming, um, reads in three languages, hums song from an opera, reads Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman emperor known as a stoic philosopher. So, I mean, it's like just really, really crazy. Um, yeah, the movies are always so off from the books. Books are always better. That's yeah, that's true. And then Rainsford, as described by Rastoff, that he is the celebrated hunter. I've read your book about hunting snow leopards. Um, and it's just, I said Rastoff. Why did I say Rastoff? It's Zer Zeroff. Where I'm looking at this saying, did I say, I, I, I typed around. English teacher fail. We are first one of the night. Cool. Okay. Well, no, I get, yeah. Yeah. Our first one of the night. I'm like, wait a minute. That's not his name. Um, no, he, he wasn't really a duke. It was just showing how important he must be that this tailor was willing to make his clothes, right? Um, Ivan says, I'm, and he's describing Ivan, I'm afraid like all his race, a bit of a savage. He is a Cossack. So am I. <laughs> and <laughs> like all the hashtags I was thinking of, Club. this is a hit foreshadowing. I'm like, cookie, cookie, better get ready. <laughs> Run for your life. Cossacks of Instagram. I just wanted that. I went, go look it up. All right. Um, yeah, maybe the, the czar's court. That's kind of interesting. I love reading these, your suppositions, your suggestions about where he might've gotten the, um, where he might have got, may have gotten the money, might've inherited it, just came. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for noticing right away. English teacher fail. Um, these are Cossacks. This is a kind of old picture. But they are from what is now the Ukraine, and um, they lived in like the Crimea and that area. And they are still, I mean, it's still an ethnic group that exists now, and they still um, do kind of dirty work for the government. I don't mean dirty work in the sense that they're bad. I mean dirty work in the sense that they are known as good fighters on horseback. They have very distinctive... Um, very distinctive clothing, very distinctive style, very conservative. It's really kind of interesting. Um, and then he says, Zeroff says, this is a most stressful spot. I'm like, yeah, as in rest in peace, right? Um, so he says that Cape Buffalo, which the head of it was on the wall, is the largest I ever saw. And I thought I would go show you a picture of what a Cape Buffalo really looks like. This is a Cape Buffalo. And he says, Rainsford says, the Cape Buffalo is the most dangerous of all big game. No, you are wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous big game. I hunt more dangerous game. Oh, Eliza, I was like, boy, run. <laughs> yep. So why do you think... He, so that Cape Buffalo is the thing that almost killed him, right? He said it took six months to recover. So why do you think he keeps the head of the one that nearly killed him? Like, 
how what does that say about him? I'm curious about what you think about how that aligns with what we already know about him and what we're going to learn about him. Why? I mean, I think that 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 is more important than it seems. Like, I think it's easy to just gloss over that as like, oh, yeah, he has the head of this thing on the wall. But I think it's really important, like, um, like to examine why he puts this in. It's not an accident. And to examine how deep the analysis we could get here is. Why is this so important? Because I think it really is. I think that scene is more important. Yeah. Not all Ukrainians are Cossacks. I'll just point that as a small group, very small, even now. Um, many Ukrainians are of Russian descent. Um, uh, Jonathan, the Van Spawn, who you've met before, he lived in the Ukraine for a couple of years as a missionary, and he speaks Russian because where he was, they spoke Russian. All right, so I think that a lot of people, when they read the title of the book or the story, if they read the title of the short story, they think it's talking about a game that's dangerous, right? Like, so, you know, Scrabble, <laughs> the most dangerous game. But that's not what it means. It's not talking about that kind of game. It's talking about the game that you hunt, right? The most dangerous game to hunt. And so I love it when the title kind of rewards the reader. Like you read it and then you know something different about it than anybody else who hasn't read it. So, um, yeah, I'm loving your comments about why you think the Cape Buffalo head is so important. It's like, it's almost like revenge. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, it's like revenge. Like, you hurt me, but I killed you and I have you on my wall. Um, yeah, so interesting. Okay, so it, 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 it's, yeah, it's kind of cool. So where did the idea of this story come from? So this is a photograph um, of a guy hunting big game. It was a big thing. Um, and especially like the 1920s, but people still do it, which I'll be honest, makes absolutely no sense to me, but okay. Um, but they would just go to Africa on these safaris and kill animals, um, for no reason other than the thrill of the hunt. This is Ernest Hemingway with a Cape Buffalo that he shot on a safari. And so it was a thing. And so, um, that is what, when, when Connell was writing this, he wrote this at the time that this was this big thing and Hemingway was going and doing it. And it was like a popular thing among the wealthy to go to Africa, see the beautiful animals and kill them. And, and I think that this story is a commentary on that. And I think that now it's easy for us to lose sight of it, but at the time it was written, it was a social commentary. This is Richard Connell. Um, and again, blocked some of it off. Sorry about that. So um, Richard Connell was born in, in 1893, the late 1800s, almost the turn of the century in, in New York, not New York City, but in Dutchess County, New York. And he worked for his dad's newspaper in high school. So he came from a, a writing family. His dad actually served in Congress and he worked, like his dad served in the US House of Representatives. If you look up Richard Connell, there will be actually two of them because one is him and one is his dad. One is the author and one is the father who was a congressman. Um, and so he went to Harvard and while he was there, he wrote for papers and he went on to write hundreds of short stories. So if you like this story, it might be worth hunting down, no pun intended, hunting down some of his other stories. He actually also wrote a bunch of novellas, so short novels and Hollywood screenplays. Um, so he, interesting fun fact that he was nominated, this is him when he was older, he was nominated for an Academy Award for the screenplay of a movie called Meet John Doe. And that movie was based on one of his short stories and it was directed by Frank Capra who directed It's a Wonderful Life. And so there's just all this is a kind of cool, right? Kind of cool. So Mark C. said a few stories ago that villains have the best backstories. And I think that is so cool. So we're going to have, and I think it's really true in this story, because we're going to have a lot of indirect characterization here as Zeroff tells his own, his whole story. 
and it's so good. I mean, go go read it again. It's so good to read that backstory. Um, I'm not. We're not gonna read it here just because it's really long. It's like two on my copy. It's like these two full paragraphs here. It's a lot, right? What did I circle? He wrote after the debacle in Russia. He's talking about the Russian Revolution, right? It's so meaty. It's so so good. All right, let's vote on the best line. You guys, I want to pick, and you can say green, blue, purple. Green, blue, or purple. Best line in the story. There is no greater bore than perfection, or instinct is no match for reason, or the weak of the world were put here to give the strong pleasure. I don't mean that you have to agree with the statement. I just mean it's the most, like, mic drop of all the statements. So green, blue, purple. Let's see what you think. Um, let's see. Yeah, people give villains the best backstories. You could give... The protagonist, an interesting backstory. Yeah, that's true. That's true, Strudel Kitty. I agree with you. Villains have no boundaries. Ooh. Wow. Villains have no boundaries. Promising. I'm going to call it right now. We're going to see that line again. All right. Villains have no boundaries. It's so meaty. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I wrote it. First time I wrote, it's so meaty. I didn't mean it. Like, I wasn't thinking that. But then I was like, ah, I better put in no pen intended. Okay. Blue, probably purple. Just looking to see what you guys say about this. 100% blue. Okay, bunch of people. Team blue. Um, some green. They're all, I mean, you know what I love is seeing how many of you, that you have different views on this because I think these were all such good lines. There were so many good, good lines. Um, oh, it's so, so good. All right. Um, but no animal can reason, objected Rainsford, because he says, I want to hunt an animal that can reason. Oh, my dear fellow, said the general, there is one that can. But you can't mean, gasped Rainsford. And why not? Oh, whoa. So, 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 so just man. Um, amazing. Okay. Zeroff thinks that Rainsford is old-fashioned because he doesn't think it's fine to kill people. And he lists, like, he says, I hunt the scum of the earth. And then he lists, like, every possible combination of people. Like, I kill the white people and the Chinese people and the black people. Like, I kill everyone. And I think that it's like, I'm not prejudiced. I kill everyone. It's really kind of crazy. And this, this is Mr. Rourke from Fantasy Island saying, naturally, I just kill them all. Right? Kill them all. Naturally. <laughs> so funny. All right, precisely, said the general. That is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They could reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. I just love this. It's like so crazy, so crazy. Oh, man. All right, sometimes when Providence is not so kind, I help Providence a bit. And he's talking about how he set up these fake lights so that ships think it's a safe channel to go through, but really he's luring them to their deaths on the rocks. And I'm like, it's a trap. <laughs> you gotta run. Um, okay, let's practice. Alliteration, there's some alliteration in here that he uses and alliteration is that repetition of that beginning consonant sound. So here we go. As they turned toward him, these are the, the dogs, the hounds, like release the hounds. As he turns towards him, their eyes glittered greenly. I have to get Serignus up here because dragons often have glittery green eyes as well. So his eyes, their eyes glittered greenly. So a lot of times authors will use alliteration, that repetition of that beginning consonant sound um, for its effect. It, it affects the way the reader reads it. It slows the reader down just a little bit. It often sparks us. We notice that pattern. It's kind of interesting. Um, so now you try it. I want you to complete this sentence. As she ran through the jungle, her blank verb and then adverb. And then I think I, I thought I had it. Did I? Nope. Okay. Um, I thought I was going to put, it's the verb and the adverb. I thought I had added another clue for you. The verb and the adverb are the ones that should have the alliteration. But if you can also alliterate with the noun, then that's bonus points. So as she ran through the jungle, her blank did what blankly. And I want the verb and the adverb to have alliteration. Let me see what you got see what you got. Let me do one. Let's see. As she ran through the jungle, 
her dragon uh hmm my dragon doesn't have very good verbs because all they can do is fly and like hoard gold sorry i think i offended your eyes all right let me see i know a <laughs> nice job B. <laughs> um let's see um i'm waiting her eyes eked exactly mm, interesting Usually alliteration would be a consonant sound, but I like eeked. As she ran through the jungle, her legs lilted limbly. Wow, okay. I like that. Her heart her heart pounded loudly, but that's not alliteration. It would have to be her heart like pounded and then the next word would have to start with a P. Um, her legs lifted loudly, her dog bounded behind. Yes, bounded behind. Her gown glittered glowingly. Yeah, that'll work. I like Jay Sand. Correcting yourself. That is beautiful. Cloudfall, give me something else that the dragon can do. Give me one. Use a dragon. All right. So I'm loving this. Her cheeky cat chopped carrots carefully. Oh, wow. Okay. We got Sally selling seashells here. Her temple pounded profusely. Nice. You guys got it, right? And now it's time. Nice job, peeps. Invariably, Mr. Rainford, invariably, they choose the hunt. And this is when they have to choose between being hunted by Zeroth or tortured by Ivan. And he's like, invariably, they choose the hunt. So I've got Mr. Work back again. I love that. Hold on, I gotta go back so I can make it do it again. Oh, I gotta do it one more time. <laughs> I just love this so much. You guys have been waiting for this. <laughs> I've been wanting to do this. So, okay, sorry, I'll move on. Okay, so I just wanna bring up some illusion here because I'm an English teacher and that's what I do for fun. So when you are caught between two difficult choices, that's called a dilemma, a choice between two difficult choices. Boy, you guys are still giving me some great alliteration. Um, and I wanna give you some examples that you will see in literature of how they will refer to this. So they will sometimes refer to being caught between the Scylla and Charybdis. And Scylla and Charybdis were two sea monsters. One was jagged rocks and the other was a whirlpool. You see them here. Made famous in a police song. Caught between the Scylla and Charybdis is lyrics in a police song. You will see that. You will hear the phrase caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. And then obviously caught between a rock and a hard place. So if you're ever writing and you need to describe a character who is caught between two difficult choices, then use one of, you can use one of these three things. And I put them in order from top to bottom of most impressive to most mundane. So if you want to really impress people, Scylla and Charybdis, and then next, Devil in the Deep Blue Sea. Her devil, her dragon followed fervently. Thank you, Jay Sand. Very nice. The hunting was not good. He made a straight trail that offered no problems at all. It's most annoying. Will you have another glass of Chablis? And it's just just the position between just nonchalantly referring to killing this guy last night or just like minutes earlier, really. And then the the elegance and sophistication of a glass of wine, right? Like that is so crazy. Outdoor chess. He calls it outdoor chess, the hunting of the men. And I'm curious asking you guys, in what ways is that true? In what ways is it true that his hunting of men is outdoor chess? Nice. I will give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. And when I read this, I always think, oh, okay, well, if you give your word, Mr. Hunter of Humans. And as the hunt begins, we enter a whole new phase of conflict. So we've got so much conflict going on in the story. And I, I if you read analysis of this story, you're going to find lots of teachers. Um, okay. That's funny. Michael saying, I can never remember Scylla. So I just say Charybdis. Um, any analysis you read of the story, we'll talk about the man versus man conflict, which is obvious, right? Rainsford versus zero man versus nature. Cause he's out in the jungle fighting the jungle man versus himself, which is this inner conflict of, should I care what other people feel? Should I care what animals feel? I think there's also this man versus society conflict, but nobody else talks about it. So I'm like, no, just me. I see this man versus society conflict as well in that Zeroff is in conflict with his society because his society says, no, actually you should not hunt humans. And 
so I think that that there's this societal conflict of is it different to hunt humans than to hunt animals? Um, so okay, I'm seeing some of your your connections to chess. Okay, you have to be three steps ahead. Nice. Um, and then you can withdraw. You're trying to conquer and subdue the player's pieces. One player being nature or the human race. Nice. Um, kind of cool. I'm loving it. All right. And then he says, I must play the cat of the fable. And this is an illusion. This is a, ref an, a reference to a fable of the cat and the fox. And in the fable of the cat and the fox, the fox is like, oh, I only know one way. I, I don't. How many ways are there to escape the hounds? What are all the ways? And the cat says, oh, I only know one way. And the hounds are coming. And the cat says, I only know one way. And he goes up a tree. And then the hounds come and get the fox. And so um, when he says, I must play the cat of the fable, anybody who's read the fable knows he means I need to run up the tree. And then the suspense just keeps growing because we hear an apprehensive knight crawled by slowly like a wounded snake. Oh, oh, the figurative language in this story is just off the hook. All right, something was coming through the bush, coming slowly, carefully, coming by the same winding way Rainsford has come. We've got alliteration. We've got some anaphora. We've got more figurative language. We've got duplicate alliteration. I mean, it is amazing. Yeah, so Mark C says if the story is a comment on society, then is it man then is it man versus society? So not necessarily. An author can make a comment on society, even a parody or a satire, without actually having that conflict clear in the story, the reader having to make the inference. All right, so there are so many traps in the story. There's the lights off the channel that Zeroff does. There is the Malay man catcher, which Rainsford does, and it hurts Zeroff's shoulder. There is the Burmese tiger pit that Rainsford does that kills the dog. And then there's the Ugandan spring trap that Rainsford uses that gets Ivan um, with the blade. And so those are all the traps. And you know what? When I read that, you know what I thought? You know what we need? Sam. We need Sam. We need Sam's skills, right? Like that. Anybody else think about that? Anybody else think, you know who Rainsford needs right now? Rainsford needs Sam Gribbly up there or on from Gribbly's farm. We need Sam. All right. I think it's weird. Zeroff, he's sad about the death of the dog, but not people. And friends, in case you were wondering, that's not normal. The general was saving him for another day's sport. The Cossack was the cat. He was the mouse. Now this is a different illusion, right? This is not the same story. It, when he said earlier, I have to be the cat in the fable, this is different. This is like a cat and a mouse game where a cat chases a mouse. Then it was that Rainsford knew the full meaning of terror. And it's at that moment that Rainsford becomes the jaguar. Earlier in the story, when he says, who cares how a jaguar feels? Perhaps the jaguar does, but they've no understanding. Now, this is the moment that comes back to haunt him, comes back to haunt him. The part of the man versus society argument that we have to take into consideration, is it morally correct? Yes. So that's an interesting idea. Yeah, you guys are on it. You guys are seriously like the best. You are the best. Okay. He lived a year in a minute. More figurative language. Oh, I love that line. Rainsford hesitated. He heard the sounds. So he's at the top of the cliff. He hesitates. He hears the sounds and then he leaped far out into the sea. No, I think Cloudfall says I sometimes get more sad about the death of a cat in a book than a human. I think that's, I think that's pretty normal because we definitely sympathize with animals. Animals are more helpless. We, we feel that way about anything that doesn't feel in control of its life and animals are definitely subject to human whim and stuff. So I think that's, that's true. Um, calls to the dogs, better luck next time. That's what, that's what Zero says. And it's so ironic because he's telling them better luck next time. And next time it's going to be him, but he doesn't know it. I love that. All right. A man. Yeah, it was the hounds coming. Um, a man who had been hiding in the curtains of the bed was standing there. It's so weird that it doesn't even say Rainsford who was standing, right? And he said, Rainsford did not smile. I am still a beast at bay. 
And so I got this cool picture of a jaguar because it's like, ah, he is the jaguar now. He had never slept in a better bed, Rainsford decided. And then this is what this is what Mr. Rourke would say at the end of Fantasy Island, like whenever anybody's fantasy was over and they wanted to do it again, he would always say, oops, oops, oops. He would say, ah, I kind of made it back one. Your fantasy is over. And that's what Rainsford says to Zeroff. Like, I just think that's what he says. I feel like he's saying, your fantasy is over. All right. Um, let's see. And I think, okay, I'm kind of just kidding, but I think the moral to the story is don't smoke. Because if Zeroff, or if Rainsford hadn't been smoking up on deck, his pipe wouldn't have gotten caught in the rope and he wouldn't have leaned over and he wouldn't have fallen into the ocean. And so there is a legal term that's like, but if not, right, like if not for, um, if not for that, then this would have happened. And I think like if he hadn't been smoking, so cautionary tale, friends, don't smoke and you will never fall overboard chasing your pipe and get caught up with the crazy person. All right. Theme of the story. I want you to vote, man. Y'all, what is going on with this? This is making me a little bit. Whoa. Hello. Hi, everyone. Okay. Let me make myself just a little bit smaller. There we go. Okay. I want you to pick a theme. Pick a theme that you think is the theme of the story. You can only pick one. All of these are valid. There's no right answer, but I want to know what you think. To understand someone, you have to walk in their shoes. No human is superior to another. Only the strong survive, or we are all less civilized than we think we are. And you can just call it A, B, C, or D in the interest of chat type. Don't smoke or do drugs, kids. That's exactly right. All right. Let's see. Okay, curious. I want to see these themes. I'm going to leave them up. What, Mr. Vanstar just made this interesting you sound. Your, you fix your video because it was always live stream of you. Yeah, I think that's what happened. Yeah, he just said, oh, that's what it was. And I had something wonky with my video. So that's why. Okay, the author had a twofold. But okay, I'm seeing him come in. A and D. D, 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 D. Whoa, okay. Only one vote so far for B. A, B, D. All right. D, just because I love Lord of the Flies so much. Oh, I love Lord of the Flies. It's so dark. Let's read it. <laughs> okay. All of them. What? Okay. Um, yeah, they all are. They're all right, right? I love seeing these come in. Okay. Okay. I want you guys to decide. Door number one, this is what happens. You guys get to pick what happens next, right? If we're going to have a sequel, a sequel, Rainsford makes a dramatic change. Instead of reporting the psychotic killer Zeroff to the authorities, he takes his place as master of the island and resumes the hunt. Like, he starts hunting people because he's developed a taste for it now. Or, door number two, Rainsford makes a dramatic change. He gives up his love of hunting and becomes an animal rights activist. Okay, um... I love the idea um, that that Michael is saying. I love stories that reveal our inert are. I think he means like inherent. Inert means that it's um, like not moving. Um, are I think he means like inherent or innate. I think that's the word you're going for. Innate, innate animalism, because it's so accurate. Yeah, it's so accurate. E all of the above, right? Yeah, all of the above. Okay. Door two, door number two. Um, yeah, we definitely we definitely need to add the hashtag, it's so dark, let's read it. Um, that definitely needs to get added. Okay, I'm just reading all of your things. Um, door number two. Oh, y'all. Door number one, 100%. Okay, I like J-Con. I like you guys voting for door number one. I think door number one is the, like, most uh, cool one, even though it's creepy right? It's so dark. Let's vote for it. Okay. Um, I just can't stop staring at the chat, looking at what you guys have to say. Okay. So next class, we're going to do, we're going to do another novel study. Uh, and we're going to do this book. This book, uh, is called a day. No pigs would die. And when I read it, when I was your age, the cover looked like on the left. Now the cover looks like on the right. I do not like the new cover at all, at all, um, but there it is. 
I put this link here and maybe Mr. Van Star will put it in the chat. I put this link because if you're looking for it on Amazon, you can find cheap, cheap copies. It'll be in your public library too, but you can find cheap, cheap copies on Amazon. But if you just search the title on Amazon, the results come back wonky. And so that's why I'm putting this direct link to this one, but you'll, you'll find that. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to read it in three classes. The first one, March 26th. So I'm going to give us a whole month just so that it gives everybody time to get the book or maybe they have to wait for their turn from the library or whatever. Um, but then we're going to do it every two weeks. So class is going to be March 26th, April 9th, and April 23rd. Um, and then, uh, so for the next meeting, March 26th, read through chapter five. Um, and it is a novel. Yes, it is a novel. It has 15 chapters, it, but it's not thick. It's not a thick novel. I debated, I actually was thinking a lot about doing one of these two novels. And um, you guys can tell me if you have an opinion. Um, Fever 1793. I don't know if any of you have read it. It came highly recommended. I haven't read it yet. Um, but when I flipped through it, it felt it was like about a disease. It was like about a pandemic. And I thought maybe that's a little too close to home. Another book that I had considered is called Rabbit Hill. And Rabbit Hill is so skinny. Look at it. It's like a, it's a novella for sure. It's a, a very short novel. It is um, written by a guy named Robert Lawson. And it's, it's an animal story. So it's a story of animals living in a house that new people buy the house. And one of the things that I love about it are the illustrations, um, if you could see. And it just reminded me somewhat of the illustrations from um, how important the illustrations were in My um, my Side of the Mountain. Um, they, I loved this book when I was your age. I loved it. I just, I didn't pick it yet. We may come back to it. I didn't pick it yet because it is maybe younger, a little younger than we skew. But if you haven't read it, I love it. Um, Okay, uh, announcing a longer novel. Uh, Cloudfall, wait, because in the summer, we're going to do a long and involved novel. So, yeah. Oh, Michael, you should read it. If you own Rabbit Hill, you should read it. You will, you, you will really like it. I think you really were. Um, yeah, we'll read a long, a long novel. All right, so, everyone... Bye-bye. Right. One of the things that the Fantasy Island was famous for was the tattoo character. Whenever the plane would come toward the island, he would say, the plane, the plane. And he was very famous for saying that. So I want to thank you guys for coming to class tonight. Thank you for participating in this story. You guys all have a lot of faith in Rainsford that most of you chose door number two. Um, but... I think that uh, you guys analysis, your analysis is spot on and I love to be with you. So excited. And I'm looking forward to reading A Day No Pigs Would Die With You. Uh, it's, it's dark and sad. <laughs> Let's read it. So, all right. Bye-bye everyone.